So, um, this is a justice dialogue on cooperatives, no bosses, no landlords. I guess it's mostly for the benefit of the viewers of a video on the website and wherever this may be posted. And for our host, thanks for organizing it, Aaron. Uh, Henry, you should know that uh, we usually get people coming in late. Yeah, that's yeah. true. I mean, I'm and, and I'll early, say though. for yeah. the viewers too that like this is a very, very busy time right now. Buffalo is dealing with uh, a lot of stuff with our uh, transit service and there's events at the downtown library and there's people in City Hall negotiating for Occupy Buffalo to stay in Niagara Square. So we have a lot going on and I'm sure people are busy. Um, to give a brief talk on this, uh, the whole idea was to share the cooperative model and relate it to justice like we talked about. What is justice? If we want a just society, what does that look like? And to me, a big part of that is institutions that are run by the people who partake in those institutions and not people who are outside of them. And that's kind of like the fundamental part of cooperative. I don't have an official definition of what is a cooperative, but I would say it's any kind of a collectively managed institution. And some examples, well I guess I'll just go through like my history with co-ops. Um, Isn't that one of your names, like co-op man? Uh, I think that was a name you gave to me. Did I? <laughs> so I, I guess my first um, encounter with it was um, a place called People's Food Co-op in Portland, Oregon. And it's, I mean we have Lexington Co-op here in Buffalo and so People's Food Co-op was a, a place in Portland where you can get produce. I think it was a vegetarian. I don't think they carried any meat, but they carried most standard grocery store products. But it was run by a group of people that had a board, and all the people who were members of the co-op uh, had a say in who got to be voted onto the board, who the decision makers were. Uh, people had the ability to have a vote or have a decision uh, in some of the things that the store did, some of the products that they carried. Uh, people got returns, so you would pay in at uh, the beginning of the year or over the course of time and you would get returns over time, so you're sharing in the profits of the uh, institution. Uh, there was Portland Collective Housing, that was my first uh, introduction to housing where people were sharing space together, made decisions about the housing and about the management of the household collectively. Um, not just in an unofficial way, it's like a bunch of friends living together, making decisions about their house together, but financial decisions, management decisions, um, were not being made by a landlord or an owner, but by a group of people working together. Um, I went to New Orleans, I traveled quite a bit, and in New Orleans I was part of the Iron Rail Book Collective, which uh, was a, a bookstore and lending library, a community library set up just by people, by citizens, not by the government or uh, any other institutions other than just neighborhood folks. And that was called a, a collective, and I would make a distinction between a cooperative and a collective. Again, I don't have any official definitions, but my understanding is that a collective is a very broad term for any kind of collective effort, that you have a number of people participating in a project and making decisions together. Uh, it was not, the, the book collective was not a 501c3, it wasn't an official corporation or nonprofit. It was just a group of people who were managing this uh, bookstore, selling zines and books, lending out books, um, providing access to computers and internet. And uh, we met once a week and made decisions as a group. Anybody who volunteered at the store and decided to show up was able to participate in making decisions in, in the group. Um, and then coming to Buffalo, uh, we have obviously the Lexington Co-op that I mentioned that's been going on for many decades. The structure has changed now and it's arguably less of a, a cooperative than it used to be. Uh, there's the Buffalo Cooperative Federal Credit Union which has also been going for decades. And that's a financial institution, a bank, that makes decisions collectively. Uh, their management is all done as a collective process. And then I'm uh, part of the Nickel City Housing Cooperative, uh, which is part of a national and even international organization called NASCO, North American Students of Cooperation. And so how it works is that I live in Old Wondermoth as a house, I'm Elmwood in North, and we make decisions, financial decisions, management decisions, decisions about food purchases, uh, maintenance, budgets, things like that. We make all those decisions collectively uh, for official policies, the bylaws to the house, like as um, we're in the process of becoming a nonprofit corporation. 
and so all the bylaws are managed and changed and reviewed and such collectively at our general assemblies. Um, <coughs> so pretty much all decisions on a small level to a, uh, a large scale are made as a household. We have several meetings per month uh, and several general assemblies per year. Uh, and I'll talk more about that in a moment. But that's just an example of like how housing, banking, and food uh, can all be managed by cooperative institutions. You've been talking about different kinds of cooperatives. You talked about collectives. But you shied away from defining either of them. Um, so um, I was wondering if I could maybe try and press you a little bit more and ask you um, if you could say more about how cooperative and collectives might be different. OK. I gave a, a brief um, explanation of that. Uh, I would say a collective is more of just um, a name given to a group effort. So with the Iron Rail Book Collective, there was no owner of the space. The space was rented. And there was no nonprofit status. It was just a group of people managing a project. And all the decisions and management was done collectively. And I would say the difference between that and a cooperative is that cooperatives tend to, the, the name tends to be used for institutions. So things that have a status as a corporation or a non-for-profit corporation, um, worker cooperatives, things that are established businesses. So they're institutions that definitely exist within our political and economic framework that are part of a capitalist framework. Um, they're just made, the decisions are made collectively. So you have either a board or a general membership voting on the decisions instead of uh, some kind of hierarchy where like the president or some board well, chair makes Another question I have for you besides the definitional issue is what you started saying in the connection between cooperatives and justice. Uh -huh. So I guess the question is a little important about defining because you want to make sure we mean the same things when we get into the stickier issues of what is, what's at stake for justice. Mm -hmm. So I mean usually I think I've heard you say collective in relation to Decision making, um, and I think it was suggested, but ownership. If I hear collective, and I really, I think ownership. Mm -hmm. I think shared ownership, and maybe shared decision making. Right. But cooperative can be um, shared work. Right? I guess that's what comes to my mind. Shared right. work, but not necessarily shared ownership. Is that uh, uh, does that in any way relate to the? I guess it doesn't even matter if it relates to different labels put on groups. Right. But is that going to help us with? talking about justice yeah I think the ownership Those definitions work yeah ownership something I had here I had just a few basic points and one of them I was going to say is um, how it relates to justice is that it is member owned and or member controlled as opposed to what is often termed investor owned or controlled so a lot of times you have investors people with a whole lot of money putting in their money into an institution and they make all the decisions so let's take an example of like a worker co cooperative People are making some product, making clothes, let's say. Somebody might put in a whole bunch of money for the materials and for the space and for a lot of what's going on. And then they make decisions, even though they might not be making the clothes, even though they might not be in that space. They're still making decisions that affect people who are working there and in that space. The key difference, and I, I think this is how it relates to justice, is the members are making the decisions that affect their working environment, that affect their purchases, that affect their distribution. And in a lot of cases, and I would say preferably, it's member owned as well. So a lot of cooperatives have some kind of buy-in. Sometimes it's a, a small buy-in, like something like for the housing, it could be something like a security deposit. We call it a member share. And that's something that you can get back in the future. And a lot of people have... Um, in some cooperatives it does. The original idea for this housing cooperative in Buffalo and how some housing co-ops work is that you buy part of the house itself. So let's say that a house costs $100,000 and you have 10 members and each member pays approximately $10,000. That's collective ownership. You each own a share in that house. And then as the house appreciates value, so does your share. And so if you move out and someone else moves in, you could sell your share for the $10,000 plus whatever for inflation and appreciation of value. And so that's outright collective ownership. And that goes hand in hand with the decision making. If you own a certain percentage of an institution, you're going to make decisions proportionate um, in that institution.
So I think uh, the member ownership and member control, and they're, they're not always the same. Sometimes the members actually have a financial ownership, and other times it's more financial control, uh, or just maybe not even financial, but management. Right. And so for example, at Nickel City Housing, the way it's been set up is the members do not own the house outright. We pay a $250 member share that's kind of like a security deposit, and we pay what we call a shelter share, or just call it rent, that goes to our parent organization. So that's kind of like a landlord in that we're giving money into this uh, part of the organization that doesn't live there. However, we can send and do send representatives from our house and our organization to the board of the parent organization. So we are directly represented in the larger organization. So we have a say in how our household and other households are managed. And financially, uh, a very large portion of the money that we pay in comes back to us in the form of um, maintenance reimbursements and maintenance um, you know, budget lines. So we have a major maintenance fund, a minor maintenance fund. Uh, we have an emergency fund that if you know, anything happens that's outside of the scope of the normal budget, we can help take care of it. But and basically, you're, have, you're, you're employing collective means of ensuring your lives or yeah, your activities. Absolutely. And so we won't, we will likely never own the property outright, even though that was part of the original intent and that wasn't how things worked out through the agreement with NASCO, between Nickel City and NASCO. But um, all the financial decisions are made by us, even in times of debt, how the debt is managed. People aren't just told, like in our society, it's like, here's your debt, pay up. And if you can't pay up, there's a late fee. And if you can't pay the late fee, you know, it's just piled up on top of us. We're here in a collective institution and cooperative we actually get to determine what kind of structure we have for the debt, what kind of payment plan we want to work out, how do we deal with these things. Since we're being represented by the parent, or we're, we're being represented in the parent organization, we have a say in how things are managed. It isn't a separate entity telling us how things need to be run. It's, it's a cooperative decision. Can I keep asking questions? I have one sure. other big question, yeah, go ahead. really. Um, so I heard one of the things you said is that you your nickel co cooperative is waiting in a process of getting a, getting becoming a corporation. Yeah, five one C three, not five. Um, and so the thought I've been kind of playing with for a while now is, you know, goes back to Marx, and he says the ruling um, the ruling mode of production sets. This, the, the norms for the society, so everything in society tends to reflect the interests of the rule or the mode of ruling. Mm -hmm. You know, so everything in a um, monarchy, the structures of power tend to mimic monarchical relations. You have one guy who is in charge has absolute power over other people. And democrats, democracy should have democratic associations and so forth. Mm -hmm. But what we actually have in our democracy is capitalist associations. And Marx argued that it was really it wasn't really a democracy, it was actually a kind of corporate control. It was right. kind of you know he said the the Democrat the, 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 the executive committee of the of the democratic regime is really just a front for the captains of industry. Mm -hmm. I mean he said that eight in the uh, manifesto in eighteen forty eight. Sure. And it seems to describe pretty well what we have. Sure. And so I look around and everywhere, if you want to be in our society, you have to become corporate. Right. Even if it's you know, not for profit, but it's still corporate. Right, right. So um, I guess what I want to raise as an issue is, um, is there some justice that you get from cooperatives or collective endeavors um, that's different from what you can get from corporations? And are you, are you concerned about having to take on corporate clothing in order to continue your existence as a cooperative? Um, well, there's two things going on there. The second one, I am a little bit concerned about it. I haven't been the one pushing so hard for the 501c3 status, but there's certain like enormous advantages to it financially in the way we're managed. Um, and the other thing, and I think this is the broader point that's being addressed, it isn't a radically, totally different system. It's not creating and establishing this radically different system from capitalism, from our current political dynamic. Why I see it as being more just, though, is that it's shifting 
the structure of decision making and representation. And so, yes, cooperatives shifting it from one to one, shifting it from concentrations of power and more vertical hierarchical power to broader, larger, more horizontal, more accessible forms of participation and power. So you, we're used to a society of power over. And this, I think, is a transition to power with. And that's huge. That's a big part of this Occupy movement. I think um, there is something written that's a really wonderful treatise kind of online about all this stuff we talk about politics and economics and reform and all this is really just symptoms of the disease. And that the disease really is that our voices aren't being heard. And I firmly believe that. In any form you go to, whether it's political, whether it's economic, whether it's social, the majority of people's voices and concerns aren't heard and addressed. Can you mention which authors or articles uh, recommend uh, for that? I mean, on Occupy Buffalo, there's um, an article called The Power of Occupy. And it was a woman was just posting things online and they were compiled and just put up as like one long post. And just this woman's views, I think, speaks very directly to what this movement's about. She never claimed that she was speaking for the entire movement. Um, and maybe that was implicit in her language. Mm -hmm. But but I think what's what's at the, the root of this here, and why it's a matter of justice, and why I'm speaking out of the justice dialogue, is that cooperatives still exist within a capitalist framework. And a lot of them being 501c3, or being outright corporations, collect cooperative corporations, are part of the broader society and the societal norms, the structures that we have, like 501c3 or public benefit corporations or whatever you want to call them. But the major shift and why it's a more just uh, endeavor is because people's voices are heard and respected and incorporated. So for example, I'm the president of the board. Now in a lot of organizations out there when it's very hierarchical, the president gets to make decisions. They get to do things without necessarily the consent of everybody who's part of that organization. I can't do that as part of the Nickel City Housing Co-op. I have to have the consent of the rest of the board and the consent of the membership to be able to enact anything. I don't really have any decision-making power other than as a member of the whole. And my whole title of president is just for these societal norms, for the paperwork and all that crap. I don't really have any authority. I wasn't elected to represent us anywhere else. I just kind of like, keep information tidy, kind of remind people of when our meetings are, more administrative stuff than, than anything to do with like power or decision making. Um, so I think that's, that was a key point that I wanted to make, is that like a lot of co-ops, see I'm most familiar with housing co-ops, and the majority of co-ops in the world right now are worker co-ops. They're, they're part of the capitalist system, they create products, they sell products, but they're doing so collectively. And right now we have like a pyramid structure where all the people at the bottom are working and getting, you know, pennies and getting minimum wage. And the people at the top are just reaping in the, the millions and, and, and benefiting from all the work of the people below in the pyramid. And cooperatives, that doesn't happen. There's nobody at the top to get all the money. The money is made and is distributed collectively. I can't say that it's exactly equal in every single cooperative, but the whole idea is that it's distributed equally. The people who are working in the cooperative have a say in how that pay is being distributed, how the profits are being distributed. A lot of times there's member shares where people who buy in and participate, such as at the Lexington Co-op, receive a dividend at the end of the year. So by spending money and purchasing money and showing your, your favoritism towards certain co-ops, they return you with a financial benefit at the end of the year, you get dividends. So it makes it a lot more participatory, a lot more equal. You know, Walmart doesn't give you any money back at the end of the year. You spend a million dollars at Walmart and they're not gonna give you anything back. Well, spend a, a million lot of people percent. already feel that they give you money back. It's kind of like the lie of a, of a ad that says, save even more because so many things are on sale. Yeah. So you will give us your money but because it's this much less than you would have spent if you bought it somewhere else, you save this much money. Now, be that as it may, you know, that, that's their claim. So I just bring that up because what you're saying, co-ops give you back money, isn't too different from Walmart saves you money. I suppose the structure is organized a little bit different, but then there's no way of really knowing other than like taking their word for it, what that difference is that you're saving. I mean, 
it's, well, it's out there. It's, it's on the internet. You can read documents that Walmart just makes up. I don't know how exactly they come up with it, but they come up with these quirky prices to make people feel like they're saving a lot more. So when you hear four ninety nine or ten ninety nine, it's kind of this, you know, like societal norm. But when you hear two dollars and thirty eight cents, well, now that's some random price. They must be really squeezing the pennies in there for me to save. Maybe that's true. Maybe not. I mean. Uh, Right, but it's an empirical question. The answer is, what, how, how much can you get it for the same product in someplace else? Right. You know, and so it's, um, I'm just saying in principle, whenever we make arguments about we're saving you money or you're getting money back, um, to me the argument for cooperatives is the one you, I think, have already made about respect for the person and giving them a voice. Right. Um, and I think we can also talk about how it, there's another strip over here. Right there. There's, we can also talk about the way in which it might transform society, making it more just and overall. Right. Sense. And that's how healthier people and so forth. And so on that point, like that was something else. Uh, thanks for just, like setting me up here. My uh, presentation is like uh, we talk about short, medium, and long-term goals, and we talk about inform, reform, and transforming society. I think the shift to uh, cooperative institutions is a humongous part, is an essential part of the midterm goals and of the reform process. It isn't exactly the society that we want to see in the end run, it's not a complete transformation of the way we do business, but it is a huge step away from consolidation of power and consolidation of wealth by spreading out the decision making, allowing people to participate more broadly, allowing their voices to be heard and to matter, by spreading and distributing the wealth more equitably, we're transitioning away from this hyper-capitalist society where everything's concentrated and more towards the world we want to see where everybody truly is equal. Um, a lot of people have a hard time imagining an economy not based on competition. You know, all these stories, these myths are pounded into our head over and over throughout the course of our entire lives. And the major one now is that competition is completely natural. It's just like animals out in the kingdom, like eventually you're going to have animals that are fighting over resources and they're going to come to each other's throats. And I think that's a myth. That's something that we had to deal with. And I think scarcity is a myth. Um, it's, it's been estimated that somewhere between a quarter and a third of the world's food supply is thrown away. It's either wasted, Especially it's in the lost, United States, it's yeah. it's uh, thrown out, it's spoiled. And people would rather throw the food in a dumpster uh, a lot of corporations choose to throw it in a dumpster rather than give it away uh, because they don't want to give people the impression that food is that abundant. It's you have to pay this demand. Money. If they if they put more food on the market, you know, food that they might want to describe as spoiled or less fresh, then the value of each product has to go down. It's supply and demand. If there's more food, you can you can call you can demand less money for it. Exactly. If there's less food, you can demand more money for it. Um, a lot of supermarkets, like you were suggesting, um, have uh, trash compactors that make it so that their garbage can't fit in their dumpsters, um, so people can't go in there and scoop it up. Right. I mean, they, they, they uh, purposely buy compactors so they can destroy the food so no one will want to go in the dump, dumpster and get it. Mm -hmm. uh, in part because they put so much food that actually could be eaten in those dumpsters. So. Um yeah, it's hard to imagine for a lot of people an economy based in cooperation. And people, somebody was challenging me and asking me about like, oh, well, when you have an organization and they need certain resources and another organization and they need resources, eventually they're going to compete. And I was like, well, does media working group like fight with kitchen working group? No, they've performed different functions and sure, sometimes they need the same resources, but they're not fighting each other for those resources. They're finding ways of sharing. What does media have to offer another working group, strategic planning. What does strategic planning have to offer another? And that was another link I was going to draw between this movement and um, cooperatives in general. We pride ourselves in this movement as um, being uh, transparent, being non-hierarchical, being participatory, being driven towards consensus. And that's what many, many co-ops are organized as as well. Uh, we have general assemblies several times a week to take in the input of all the people and discuss important issues. And in cooperatives, there are meetings and general assemblies that have been happening for decades. And it's a very similar idea, is that there's meetings for what could be called work groups or subcommittees or whatever. 
So you have people working on maintenance in a institution, at, at a workshop or in a house. You have people who are working on finance. You have people who are working on um, bulk food ordering, whatever the case may be. They do those things autonomously or make decisions together as a group and then come together to uh, make the final decision and make sure everybody in the, in the worker collective or in the housing collective is okay with that decision. Uh, we have a general assembly coming up in uh, just a week or two. And so there's things that we've been working on that affect our membership, opening up our membership. This is the uh, general assembly for the co-op? Yeah, for Nicholas City Housing Cooperative. We're having, it's a quarterly general assembly for a year. And so at this general assembly coming up, we have things dealing with our membership and uh, dealing with the bylaws to allow for a more open, inclusive membership. And uh, organizing a Buffalo Cooperative Summit. This is the International Year of the Cooperative, uh, as designated by the United Nations. And uh, so these are things that have been in the works. You know, we had groups of people working on them and we've talked about it as houses. And so all the members of the two houses that comprise Nickel City Housing Co-op are going to get together and, you know, discuss these issues and, and have a vote on what issues uh, to change or whatever. Well, what do you think would be the best long-term strategies for um, the whole horizontal um, model for, you know, cooperative and uh, collective uh, economies in terms of like uh, producing uh, goods and services to compete and finally supersede the uh, now predominant corporate right. uh, global uh, model. Um, I mean, it, it sounds great. It's just that in terms of the, the larger market bias in the world at this point, uh, most people think, well, no, this is impossible. What, what, how do you see this eventually uh, competing and, and finally just dominating the, uh, you know, the global economic paradigm? Well, I would say, I mean, the goal for a lot of cooperatives, and I would say the cooperative movement, I mean, there's a lot of literature out on this right now because, you know, this is called the International Year of the Cooperative, yeah. is to, first and foremost, raise public awareness and just make people aware of what, the fact that this isn't something that's far off. This isn't something that's just being imagined. This is something that's real. Cooperatives are real. I think the, I don't have the statistic, but it's in the multiple billions of dollars uh, of profits and commerce that was done by worker cooperatives. The United States is one of the only countries in the entire planet that isn't part of an international council of cooperatives. So we talk about you know moving this economy from a competitive economy to a cooperative economy. And people say, oh, that can't happen. Guess what? Most of the planet uh, is already shifting and transferring uh, the institutions from hierarchical to cooperative institutions. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's going to be really hard to compete against uh, these giant monsters like Exxon and, and uh, BP and like the energy companies sure. and such. I mean, how do you have like a cooperative or collective oil, oil company, for example? You know. Yeah, I think they're going to run themselves extinct and the cooperatives movement is already building the alternative. So as, you know, we have ecological crises and economic crises mm -hmm. and as some of these giant uh, behemoth structures of, of uh, corporate mergers and stuff start collapsing, uh, the alternative is already in place. I mean, like I said, there's billions of dollars uh, in business being done by cooperatives already. People are forming new cooperatives all the time. Uh, I'm going to learn at the end of March, there's a upstate New York cooperative summit in Syracuse on March 31st. Mm -hmm. And uh, I'll be attending that and learning the details on establishing the cooperative uh, we hope to have a Buffalo Cooperative Summit in June and talk again more about like brainstorming on how to develop cooperatives. We already have a handful of them in Buffalo. There used to be more. We used to have three food cooperatives. Now we only have one. Uh, so this is something that can be done. It's something that is being done. It's just a matter of raising awareness and raising public participation in the cooperatives that already exist and just continually building on that network. So. I have a question that's kind of a, a, a justice issue, a challenge to cooperatives. Mm -hmm. So the appeal is that it, it's more just in the sense of you don't have power over, it's more equitable. Um, but there's the other sense of justice, which is like what gets you dessert. You know, like um, you do stuff so you've earned it, you know. Um, so what about the, there's two things, the problem of um, recognizing difference in, in, in terms of your contribution, right? And so that's, 
that's like kind of one, it, they're really connected issues, but recognizing the difference of contribution and then the problem of free riders or freeloaders, <coughs> um, which are two different terms, but they're similar things. You know, so how do you deal with people who aren't carrying their weight? Like how do you deal with people who really, you know, they really do more? Yeah, uh, I think that is an inevitability that you're gonna have people who contribute different amounts, either because they have different capabilities or because of their desires or whatever. Uh, and it's a really tricky one, it's a really tough one. And there's no easy answer, but it's something that cooperatives deal with every day, all the time, that I deal with at the housing cooperative. Because we're consensus-based and we're, we're looking to build consensus, what do we all agree on? What is something that we can all get behind? What are our principles, what are our values? I think establishing that up front is, is first and foremost a very important thing, is like to know what the principles and the values of the cooperative are. So that way when people come to participate, to work there, to live there, what have you, they know what they're getting involved in, they know what's expected of them, they know where they can contribute, how they can contribute. So having like a well-established set of like principles uh, to guide the organization is important. Um, having really good processes for dealing with things. Right now our society is really terrible, I think, with dealing with problems like, oh, you're a criminal, go to jail, lock them up. It's called Department of Corrections, the Department of Rehabilitation, yet there's just arguments made about letting prisoners out in the population and that's a bad thing. And there's also, well, you know, the problem too of like prison labor that becomes more profitable to jail people for, you know, Oh, larger respects, yeah, right. Yeah, and so the idea is like, if it's a Department of Corrections, why would you be upset about releasing prisoners into the public if you've corrected them, if like we've fixed the problem, but you haven't fixed yeah. the problem, you have no intention of fixing the problem. And a lot of cooperative institutions, um, there are accountability processes for dealing with these things. For example, NASCO, it started as um, a group of student co-ops in Ann Arbor, Michigan and it's grown and grown, and it's this huge organization that's primary focus is education, has over 10,000 members, and some of the biggest things that they push are anti-oppression trainings and workshops, how to participate in things equitably, how to deal with conflict, conflict resolution, um, all different kinds of stuff. They're involved with um, Icarus Project, which is redefining mental health. Yes, I've Instead heard of it. just saying like, um, oh, you don't fit into societal norms, you're mentally ill, take these pills. It's like, well, where are our norms? What are the expectations of our institution, of our co-op? And how are you fitting into those norms and how are you not fitting into those norms? Are those norms, are those norms just? Right. Are they fair? Right. Are there ways that we can help you? Is this something that you're willing to do? Is this something that you're capable of doing? How can we as an organization assist you from getting where you are now to where it is we all want to be? And so these are things that we're dealing with uh, as a housing co-op and doing quite well. I'd say the the feel, the energy, the vibe, um, the participation has all increased dramatically in the past year or two now that we're focusing on um, cohesion, cooperation, communication, all those things, uh, you know, not letting things build up but dealing with interpersonal communication, group communication. Uh, so those are important values to us and to a lot of um, cooperative institutions. There's no easy way out of you know our interpersonal problems. Can I can, can I take this from what you're saying then? Um, there is the idea if you're cooperating, if it's a collective, right. um, you will all feel the effect of each person's contribution. Mm -hmm. So the group kind of sinks or rises with each person. Or another way of putting it, more competitive model is, uh, you know, the whole chain is made weak by a weak link. Yeah. Um, that is a more competitive model, but I think the idea is more, if everyone does stuff, everyone benefits more. Right. If people don't do stuff, everyone gets less. Yeah. And that's what I'm hearing from you, but, yeah. you know, but basically, which is... Yeah, that's essentially Sounds it. Sounds fair. I mean, there's always going to be some inequality, you know, like some people are going to work a little bit less or, or be capable of working a little bit less, and other people are going to work more or maybe they're more capable of putting in that work. And I think that's some degree of that is inevitable in human structures. But the question is, how can the people who are more capable and putting in more effort, how can they share that? How can they share their knowledge? How can they share their ability and their resource? 
and how can they help the people who are struggling or who are less capable? And that's the thing, is, and how it relates to justice, is that one of the primary ideas behind cooperatives, let's say it's a worker cooperative, it isn't all about profit. It's about being able to sustain yourself, hopefully make some kind of profit, and have everybody in the institution participating. And, but also to create good benefit. things, right? To work cooperative, yeah, right? Absolutely. Aren't they concerned about their work? Absolutely. I mean, I would hope so. Goods. Sure, so uh, our cameraman has to go, and I mean, uh, I'll just say, uh, you know, come down to Nickel City Housing Co-op any Wednesday, 7 p.m. for potluck, ask us questions, look us up on the web, keep an eye out for the Buffalo Cooperative Summit in June of this year. Um, yeah, and look up uh, cooperatives online, co-op institutions. Please learn more, check it out. Great, thank you. Yeah. Right. Excellent. Thank you. Thank you. This is, um,